I should say at the beginning that I have a bad cold and I have no idea whether my voice is going to hold out for this talk, but we'll give it a try. This is an advanced propulsion workshop and this is a very advanced idea, which means that we have, I have no idea how you'd actually go about doing it. <laughs> um, we can track wormholes back to, the, to 1500 AD. Uh, this is a picture from the uh, Palace of the Doge in Venice. Uh, by Hieronymus Bosch showing a wormhole connection between earth and heaven in which the blessed are taken from one place to the other. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> more recently, um, wormholes were <clears throat> invented uh, or were perceived to exist in the uh, structures of general relativity by Einstein and, and Rosen. Um, basically what Einstein and Rosen were trying to do is something very similar to what the, the speaker in the previous talk was trying to do, trying to explain what el electrons and positrons are. And their, their idea was that there, if, if you had a wormhole that had electric flux threading through it, that one end of it would appear to be positive and the other end would be, appear to be negative, and therefore that, maybe that's what fundamental particles are. Uh, <clears throat> It was uh, labeled by the community at the time as an Einstein-Rosen bridge. The basic idea, as I said, is that you have a, uh, a wormhole connecting two regions of space. You have electric flux going through them. Here you see the elect li electric lines of flux going in and ending on the object. Here, and that represents a negative charge. Here you see the lines of flux coming out of the object. And that represents a positive charge, and so they said that's what electron. Maybe that's what electrons and positrons are. The trouble is that if you calculate the mass of an object like this, uh, it doesn't have an electron mass. It has a much, much larger mass, uh, uh, some, some, somewhat comparable to the, the Planck mass. So uh, this is a um, uh, an interesting idea but it didn't uh, s satisfy its original uh, mission, which was to explain what fundamental particles are. Um, and John Wheeler subsequently uh, renamed wormholes and demonstrated that they're very unstable. And that's where things sat for a long time. Until 1988, <clears throat> when uh, we, Ray gave us a nice uh, introduction to, the, to this business uh, yesterday, uh, uh, Kip Thorne and his student Mike Morris and his postdoc, uh, <clears throat> uh, Ulvi Wertserver, uh, <clears throat> uh, were caused to re-examine the, the old idea of wormholes because Carl Sagan had had a book con had a book con a movie contract for writing a uh, uh, for writing the, the uh, a novel and a screenplay for a thing that's, uh, pr uh, that ultimately became the movie Contact, uh, and uh, he wanted ha to have his uh, <coughs> SETI radio astronomer go from the Earth to some alien civilization in a big hurry without having to get on a spaceship and take years and years to do it, and so he said, uh, hey what about wormholes? And Kip Thorne thought about it for a while and said, well, you know, the, the real problem is that they're horribly unstable, but nobody's really looked very hard at seeing whether there's some way of stabilizing them. Maybe that's worth thinking about. Uh, and so he put his brightest student, Mike Morris, on the job, and Mike Morris found a way of stabilizing wormholes, which is sum sum summarized in this paper and involves the Casimir effect. Um, <clears throat> and the way they sort of envisioned wormholes to be uh, produced was that you have some advanced civilization, which means a civilization much smarter than us, who could reach down into the quantum foam <clears throat> where at the most fundamental level there's all kinds of stuff going on. There's electrons and positrons coming out and being annihilated, and there are much more complicated structures also emerging and, and disappearing all the time. And if wormholes are a valid solution of Einstein's uh, equations, then they should be spontaneously popping out of the vacuum and disappearing again over and over again. And so if you <coughs> have a, uh, a member of one of these advanced civilizations who is agile enough to reach in and grab it while it's, while it's popping into the vacuum and before it goes back in <coughs> and pays off its debt to Heisenberg in the form of energy, you can keep it. And uh, that's, the, that's the basic idea that, uh, uh, behind th this paper. Um, <coughs> okay, so 
uh, the assumption is that an advanced technology could, <coughs> by choice, keep a uh, stabilized wormhole, very small, so that in the spirit of Einstein and Rosen, <coughs> one mouth would behave like a charged particle of a certain mass and charge. Now, they also showed another interesting property of wormholes, which nobody had thought about before, which is that if you have a pair of wormholes, uh, or a pair of wormhole mouths, and you put one of these on a relativistic spaceship and send it off at a, on a trip near the speed of light for a, maybe a year, and then bring it back, <clears throat> there is a phenomenon in relativity called relativistic time dilation in which the clock on the spaceship slows down and the clock of the wormhole slows down. And so when it comes back, it's basically, basically younger than the other end of the wormhole that had, been, that had been going on in the normal direction. And so there's an <clears throat> now a <clears throat> connection between two points in space becomes a connection between two po points in time and the wormhole becomes a time machine. Um, that bothered a lot of people. And this is the statement from the, uh, uh, from the paper uh, describing what, 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 how exactly you do it, and this is their diagram here. The stay-at-home wormhole is going along like this, the traveling wormhole is going along like this, and the time connections are shown by this dotted line, this about dotted line, and the point is that they now, when these things are together, point 11 on the stay-at-home guy corresponds to point 11 up here, which is a, <coughs> which is a passage through time. <coughs> okay, um, Stephen Hawking didn't like this idea, and um, uh, he suggested that uh, there there are equations in. Uh, in general, in the interface between general relativity and quantum electrodynamics, in which there are certain intervals involving the separation between two things, and if you let these intervals go to the space-time intervals go to zero, it's, you, know, you divide by zero, and the equation blows up. <coughs> and so he suggested that <coughs> the result of this would be that the uh, fluctuations in the quantum vacuum would become larger and larger and larger as you approach this situation where you're making a time machine and they would uh, essentially cause an, a, a, a quantum explosion which would destroy the apparatus and you wouldn't be able to make your time machine. In other words, nature not only abhors a vacuum, but nature abhors a time machine even more So, uh, <laughs> and would rise up and smite the the would-be time traveler. <laughs> um, and this is called the chronology prediction. It's not really a, a proof, it's just a conjecture, but it's, uh, it has a certain plausibility in terms of the equations of, uh, <coughs> of quantum electrodynamics as, as applied to this case. <coughs> okay, now I want to talk about something called back reaction. Um, the, um, the idea, this is an idea involving wormholes which is not very widely appreciated and so therefore it's important to emphasize it. Um, <clears throat> when you have a wormhole, a, separ a, 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 a thing between here and here, you might think that you can just walk through and come out the other side and nothing else will change. Uh, that's not the way it works. Um, it, the, all of the conserved quantities on this end of the wormhole have to be preserved. All of the conserved quantities on this end of the wormhole have to be conserved. If you walk through, mass disappears from this side and appears on that side. So therefore, this end of the wormhole has to become more massive and this end of the wormhole has to become less massive in order to compensate. And this is called back reaction. Similarly, if you send an electric charge through, if you send a positive charge through, this end becomes positively charged. This end becomes becomes negatively charged. If you send angular momentum through, the angular momentums have to similarly work out. The, any, anything that's conserved has to be locally conserved at, at the end of a wormhole. Uh, and that creates problems for the would-be uh, wormhole traveler, but it also represents a certain uh, way of manipulating wormhole ends if you look at, look at it in the right way. Um, <clears throat> So suppose you wanted to uh, charge a wormhole. Well, you could in principle do it by just sending an electric current through it so that the electric current circulates through the wormhole like this and this end becomes positive and this end, the other end becomes negative. So it looks rather like a, a capacitor uh, with a positive plate and a negative plate. 
<coughs> and like a capacitor, eventually the cu current would stop when the wormhole builds up enough electric charge in order to repel the charges that are, are trying to come in. And so you would have to, if you want to get a, <coughs> a big charge, you have to use a you would have to use a very high voltage in order to do it. Um, or you could simply go to an electron accelerator and shoot a beam of electrons through it from Stanford or something and charge it up to a well, mini GeV or something, uh, if, you, <coughs> if, if you were so inclined. Okay. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, for the purposes of this talk, I want to, I'm, I'm going to make certain assumptions about our uh, would-be wormhole capabilities um <coughs> that um, uh, I want, to out, I want to lay out explicitly. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, we, I, I, we, I will assume that transversible wormholes exist and are valid as valid solutions of general relativity. There is a certain segment of the general relativity community that is, is rather disturbed by the fact that all of these things like warp drives and wormholes and so forth have been appearing in the, in the literature and would like to sort of uh, construct a barbed wire fence across the, the middle of general relativity with a forbidden region and an allowed region. Uh, the the, the uh, weak energy condition you heard about yesterday and some various other things are sort of examples of that. And they think that when uh, we have a proper theory of quantum, electric, quantum gravity that all of these, uh, these ugly solutions will disappear leaving a Fewer ones behind, uh, <coughs> um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume, assume that they're wrong. Um, <coughs> uh, secondly, uh, that wormholes can be fished out of the quantum vacuum and made any size, all the way down to the Planck length. So you don't have to make enormous wormholes; you can make things that are really quite small. Uh, thirdly, <coughs> the wormholes can be easily stabilized. Uh, <coughs> one of the uh, I guess the, the person who wrote the book on wormholes, as, you, as you, literally, is Matt Visser, who uh, the American, Journal of, American Institute of Physics published his book called Lorentzian Wormholes. And uh, he pointed out that there is another solution to, uh, <coughs> in, in general relativity, called a cosmic string. And cosmic strings can have negative string tension. And if you combine a wormhole with a cosmic string of negative string tension, you ought to get a stable object. And so if you're fishing things out of the quantum vacuum, more li you're more likely to fix, fish a stable something out of the quantum vacuum than an unstable one. And so you might be able to fish out a, a wormhole which has already been stabilized. Um, um, finally, uh, I assume that wormholes can be, be manipulated, charged, uh, changed in size, uh, given momentum, given charge, and so forth from either end. So if you have one end of the laboratory, you have complete control of the wormhole, even what's going on on the other end. Okay, so those are my assumptions. Okay, now, <clears throat> the reason we're mo most of us are here is we would really like to find a better way of getting to the stars. Um, and if, and, and um, most of the ways that have been suggested, even if these uh, <clears throat> mock, mock drives and so forth actually work, would require a really long time to get there. And what I want to point out today is that, there, that given these assumptions and wormholes, there's a way of getting there really fast, okay? Um, <clears throat> Uh, the uh, Einstein and Rosen speculated that charged particles were actually tiny wormhole mouth, mouth, mouths, and their speculation was wrong, but it raises an interesting question about whether given a, a hypothetical existence of a stable microscopic charged wormhole mouth, they could be treated like ordinary particles and accelerated with electromagnetic fields. And the answer is yes, you could, sh you, you could certainly do that uh, because, because they would have all the properties of a, of a fundamental particle. That's basically what, where Einstein and Rosen were coming from. And in particular, a uh, <coughs> microscopic wormhole mouth, if you give it the same charge to mass ratio as a proton, should behave like a proton in an accelerator. You ought to be able to put it in a, a, a conventional particle accelerator, uh, like a Van de Graaff or a cyclotron or a synchrotron, and, get, and accelerate it and give it the same velocity and the same Lorentz factor, the same uh, mass increase factor that, that you would get if you accelerated a proton the same way. Okay, so <clears throat> what, what would be available for doing this given that we had a wormhole to play with or say a, a bunch of them? Well, here, are, here is a zoo of 
of uh, accelerators. Uh, this one is the uh, Tannen van der Graaff that we have at the University of Washington, and it will accelerate protons to 19.35 MeV. Uh, <coughs> Down the coast from us, and as a machine that I've done a lot of physics with over the years, the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory 88 inch cyclotron, it will produce 55 MeV protons. Another machine I've used is the Michigan State K500 cyclotron, which will produce 170 MeV. Uh, <coughs> a machine I spent 10 years working with uh, is the uh, re relativistic heavy, heavy ion collider at Brookhaven which will produce uh, protons that have 125,000 MeV. Uh, <clears throat> another machine that I've done physics with is this, before Brookhaven was the CERN SPS, which uh, will pr produce 4 450,000 MeV protons. And the CERN LHC, which I've never used, but, I, uh, uh, but uh, is even more energetic, will produce uh, 7 million MeV protons. Um, in terms of velocities, the velocities coming out of a tandem van der Graaff is about 20% of the velocity of light. Uh, the, uh, from, from the LBL a cyclotron is 32% the velocity of light. And from the <coughs> CERN LHC is 0.9999999991% the speed of light. <laughs> um, and not percent, but a fraction of the speed of light. Um, <clears throat> the, and this is one minus beta, this is how much, how close they are to the speed of light. So you're going part, two parts in 10 to the minus 5, uh, two, parts, uh, two parts in 10 to the 6, two parts in 10 to the 9. Uh, <clears throat> there's not, once you get going this fast, there's not much point in talking about the velocity because the velocity is essentially the velocity of light. And the thing that really counts is the relativistic mass increase factor. Now this is the factor in special relativity that makes the mass get bigger the distances get smaller and time slow down, okay? All of those things are controlled by the same factor which we call gamma. And uh, Van der Graaff will give you a gamma of about 1.02 and the CERN LHC will give you a, a gamma factor of 7,000. <clears> okay, so what does that mean in terms of wormholes? Uh, <clears throat> well, if we, took, if we go to the LHC with our little, little flask of wormholes and <clears throat> put them in I mean, wormhole mouths and put them into the LHC and accelerate them, <clears throat> we should be able to get wormholes traveling at the speed, wormhole mouths traveling almost at the speed of light that we can point in various directions at stars and they will have a gamma factor of 7,455. 7, uh, <clears throat> therefore, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> and th th that will be their Lorentz velocity. Now, what does that mean in terms of the wormhole itself? Well, there's a, there's a quantity in relativity called proper time. And proper time is basically, if you go from this point to that point, you want to know how time it takes, you simply take a clock with you and you walk from point A to point B with your clock and see what the time reading is. <coughs> and um, in uh, relativity, the Proper time is equal to the observer, external observer time divided by gamma. And remember, gamma is like 7,000 for the things we're talking about. What that means is if you, if you have this wormhole mouth and you look through it to see what's going on at the other end, uh, you will see things that are slowed down <coughs> by, uh, by that factor. So if you send your, uh, <coughs> and so the, the time through the wormhole viewer goes like T prime, which is T over gamma. Uh, and uh, to the external viewer watching the wormhole travel, it's traveling essentially at the speed of light, which is um, uh, e equal, <coughs> equal to C. But through the wormhole mouth, uh, what you would see in terms of scenery going by looks like you're traveling at a speed which is gamma times the speed of light. So you would be traveling at 7,000 times the speed of light. What? Are you saying it's a straight line trajectory? Yeah. There's no. No, you just you point it at uh, at a star and it, it it goes along the straight line trajectory. And looking through the wormhole, it looks like you're going at seven thousand times the speed. The question of finding about where where is the exit really hmm? solved, where there is an exit in the wormhole that's really solvable. It, it's really what solvable. I don't understand. You can tell how, what, uh, how long it takes. Yeah. Yes. Well, where, 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 yeah. You, where you end up. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, so uh, <clears throat> NASA a few years ago identified an Earth-like Goldilocks planet called Kepler 32e. So let's use that as an example. Kepler 32e is supposed to be 1,200 light years from Earth. So a wormhole. For, so let's let's uh, accelerate <coughs> one of our wormholes, of which we have a large number now, uh, <coughs> to uh, uh, at the LHC and point it at uh, in the direction of Kepler 32e. Now. The pointing might be a problem because you you, you have real troubles with with uh, angular spread and so forth as the thing was going. And but <clears throat> since you can since there is back reaction, you can send momentum through the wormhole and it will steer the other end and cause it to move back and forth. And so you can actually do steering in order to zero in on the on the object that you're looking at. So <clears throat> here is Earth. Earth. Uh, going along this world line, and here's Kepler 32e, uh, 1,200 light years away, going along this world line, and uh, in this diagram, in this kind of Minkowski diagram, the speed of light represents a 45-degree line. So our wormhole, going effectively almost at the speed of light, just a few uh, parts per billion less than the speed of light, goes from here to here, and it takes 100. It goes 1,200 light years in 1,200 years. But as far as the, uh, as far as looking through the wormhole goes, uh, you arrive at Kepler 32e in 59 days. Uh, so you've gotten to a, a, a really distant star in a really short time. Um, <coughs> now you say that to conserve momentum, uh, the, there is a change in momentum. Actually, you have to look at the one whole mouse has to gain momentum to compensate for the momentum loss of the object going through it. Yeah. So what is the physical form which is momentum gain? What, what does it mean, the momentum gain of a one whole mouse? What does it happen? Um, it, it basically recoils. If, if, if you uh, send a... Uh, <clears throat> you, let's imagine that you take your stay-at-home mouth to an accelerator laboratory and, and point a beam of protons through it. Uh, <clears throat> the beam of protons carries a certain momentum. This moment, this uh, wormhole mouth will will recoil forward by the, the momentum of the particles that go through, and the wormhole mouth over here, having the particles come out, will recoil backwards. And so, you can steer. <clears throat> So that momentum is conserved on both. But now the one hole length is what? The one hole length, the, the distance between the one hole mouth, the both ends, has become shorter. Why? I thought that you said that one. Oh yeah. Well, okay. If you if you don't put it in a mount uh, and hold it, it will it will recoil. Of course, what what will really happen is you'll have it in some kind of trap or something. It'll just sit there, and their momentum will tra be transferred to the. To the trap in the earth, and it won't won't go anywhere. But the other end, which isn't bound by anything, will uh, will recoil, and you can use this to steer. In other words, if you're going slightly wrong to the wrong side of the star, you can send a beam of pro uh, protons through, and the thing will go uh, <coughs> change its direction. You need an environmental capsule to do this. It's a hell of a long time to be there. What? Do you need an environmental capsule for the guy that? The guy on Earth doesn't doesn't have to wait. Uh, 1,200 years for the wormhole to get there because if, if, cause he's looking through and he can... S no, but for, for the 59 days, he's traveling through it, right? Mm -hmm. for the 50 Nobody is traveling through it. The wormhole mouth... an environmental capsule to do it, though, does it? No, no. No. He just looks through the wormhole on the other side. And see where he's going. Of course, it will be, there will be some Doppler shifting problems, but, uh, which I'm not worrying about, but... <clears throat> okay. You said that they want the... One whole mouth could be held. Hmm? The, you said at the beginning, one whole mouth could be prevented from recoiling by holding it somehow. By by putting it, it's, in, it's like a charged particle. You can put in a penning trap and hold it there. So, how is momentum conserved uh, when that is done? Because it reacts against the fields. The fields push push it back where it goes. The momentum is transferred to the trap. The transfers to the earth and so forth. I just you know. Uh, that's something we know how to deal with. <laughs> um, so the answer is uh, we don't have to wait 
1,200 uh, years for, to, for the particle to get there because Kip Thorne told us that the wormhole math has become a time machine because of this relativistic time dilation thing. So what we've actually done is constructed a time machine that connects the, uh, the wormhole mouth on the Earth 59 days after its launch to the wormhole mouth at the other, 1,200 years later uh, to the wormhole mouth at the other end when it arrives at the star. So we have a, a space-time link which allows us to get the star, to the stars in a hell of a big hurry. Uh, <clears throat> okay, now suppose you uh, manage to get to Kepler uh, 32E is, are you satisfied with just a flyby that goes through the, the, uh, the system at the speed of light? You'd presumably get a little data that way, but that's not exactly what you'd like. <clears throat> and so as I was uh, saying earlier, uh, by, put it, by, by uh, sending momentum, particle, momentum carrying particles, either, uh, either protons or heavy ions, through the wormhole in various directions you can steer. So in principle you could do a grazing collision with the stellar atmosphere or a planetary atmosphere and have a whole lot of stuff uh, coming through the wormhole, which was with a mouth which would slow it down. Uh, the problem is that it would also be gaining mass a lot, uh, at, at the same time. And so uh, probably what you'd like to do is to take the stuff that's coming through and send it right back through in the other direction and, and slow it down even more. And so, but anyway, there, there are some engineering problems here, but, but in principle you could, you could use the back reaction to cause the wormhole mouth to slow down and perhaps even land on a planet. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the uh, uh, so if you were if there were a habitable planet was found, you could in principle cause your wormhole mouth to to uh, land on its surface and then open it up and walk through and you and start as start exploring and colonizing and whatever else you you wanted to do. So this is a path to the to the stars that would allow you to get there in a, in, in a very big hurry. Um, um, <clears throat> okay, now what about chronology protection? Uh, Stephen Hawking was worrying, wor worrying a lot about that. Is, is, are we, if, we, if we try to do this, is our wormhole going to explode in our face or something like that? And the answer is no. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, legal wormhole link has to be space-like. If it becomes time-like, that, that's when you get into trouble with Hawking. Uh, and since the uh, uh, <clears throat> wormhole uh, connection to, to the star is less than, uh, uh, maybe I should explain, um, this is a Minkowski diagram, anything, any trajectory that goes like this, less than 45 degrees is called space-like, any trajectory that goes th this way is called time-like, and anything like this is called light-like, and <clears throat> the, um, th what one would like to do is have your trajectory for the particle uh, be below the light-like line in order to in order to pr preserve cause, causality and do all these things and, and indeed that that is done. So there's not any real problem in terms of, of chronology protection and sending wormholes out to the stars in various directions. What might be a problem is if your colony decided to send their own wormhole someplace else and started making connections that could produce time-like loops and so you would have to make a law that the that it was absolutely forbidden for your colony worlds to, to produce their own wormholes. Um, uh, <coughs> or use <laughs> no, but is, is the chronology protection, I see it more like a, an action or a principle that, that uh, entropy must increase or uh, well, it's, it's basically that, that there should, Hawking was taking the point of view that there can be no time-like loops, right. okay? And, and if you made one of these going out here, it would, it would not be a time-like loop, but what Thorne and, and Morris and company were talking about was going out and then coming back. And if you have another wormhole link that goes from out here to over here, then you get a time-like loop and then, then you're, you get into trouble with chronology. What I'm saying is that it's not a question of preventing this colony from interconnecting themselves, it's that they are just not able to. If they tried to interconnect themselves, there would be, there would be problems, yes, uh, or, or if Hawking's right. Um, if, he's, if he's wrong, then you start getting causality violations. <laughs> okay. So, uh, in summary, uh, 
<coughs> uh, assuming that stable wormholes exist and that we can master the physics and engineering and, uh, of microscopic wormholes, we may be, may be able to use them to rapidly explore the, to the stars and co colonize uh, interesting extrasolar planets that have been turning up lately. Uh, the time-spanning properties of relativistic wormholes can be used to reach distant star systems in a very short time, in the order, the order of days, weeks, and months. Uh, the wormhole time link connects the present, where the wormhole, from which the wormhole is launched, to the future where a star is reached, so that you can get there without having to wait until, uh, at the speed of light, the object travels <coughs> there. Um, this isn't a new idea. I, uh, let me say where I, I, this came from. I, I was giving a talk about wormholes at a science fiction convention a number of years ago, and one of the people in the audience asked me, what happens if you look through the wormhole? What do you see if it's, if it's traveling fast? And <clears throat> it occurred to me that this is, this, is, this is the way it works. And I went home and worked it out, and sure enough, there's a, this is the way relativity applies to wormholes. Um, and, and so I write a, a, a science fact column in Analog uh, Science Fiction magazine, two, uh, 2,000 words, and um, I guess I, I just submitted column number 198. Uh, and one of my columns in uh, 1990 uh, discussed this idea. Um, I should also mention that if this idea is not worth anything else, uh, I was able to use it as the basis of a science fiction novel that I recently completed called Fermi's Question, which is the, uh, the sequel to my uh, second novel, Einstein's Bridge. So. <clears throat> um, the, there's a little glitch in, in getting it published because I had a contract with Tor Books uh, to, to publish uh, Fermi's Question. My editor died, my second editor got fired, and, and, uh, they, <laughs> and they dumped all of the projects he was working with, including mine, and so uh, um, <clears throat> I am I'm now fishing for another publisher. These days it's not so hard to publish yourself, so maybe I'll do that, yeah. If an advanced civilization from far, far away is able to, to cut this technology and they use it to produce a wormhole that connects to our vicinity, what would be the observational astronomy? That ah, that's a wonder, wonderful question, Jose, and it turns out that's the next point. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, this is in terms of the Fermi paradox. Uh, is, is some advanced civilization already using relativistic wormholes to explore the galaxy and our, our solar system? Well, maybe so. Uh, there are unexplained cosmic ray events called Centauro events. Centauro? That C E N T. I guess they come from the uh, the constellation. They're uh, coming from the direction of the constellation Centaurus, uh, and uh, any particle we know about, probably, including electrons, uh, if, if it form, if it's accelerated, or protons, or heavy nuclei, or whatever that forms the cosmic ray, has not only electromagnetic interactions when it hits the upper atmosphere, but it also has strong interactions that make pions and, and so forth. <coughs> you, know, you might think that electrons don't because they're weak, weakly interaction, but they make plenty of pions and stuff at, at slack when they accelerate uh, electron beams. <coughs> so these particular cosmic rays coming in, from the, uh, in at very high energies from outer space show only electromagnetic interactions and no evidence of, of strong, strong or weak interactions at all. Um, and so that's exactly the way a charged wormhole would look if it hit the upper atmosphere. So maybe we should go out to uh, Argentina where they have this big uh, <laughs> where, they, where, they, where they have this big uh, uh, cosmic ray telescope and track uh, these Centaur events down to the ground and go and pick them up and bring them home. And <laughs> which, which is more or less what the protagonists in my novel do. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I, uh, as I told Heidi, maybe I can catch us up a little bit because I didn't really have a whole hour of talk and so this is the end. And you so can I, fill it in. <laughs> so I can stop here and, and ask if there are any questions. Thank <laughs> you.